Thanks. Welcome back, Competitive Heroes community, to the Frontline Network's Competitive Heroes 2 World Championship. We are at the finals right now. Game 1 between Sefa and Aimstrong went in Sefa's favor. And this time, Aimstrong will be taking on the Soviets, and Sefa will be fighting at the Axis. So let's see if Aimstrong actually gonna deliver some M3 pain back at Sefa. See how he likes it, but you never know. Aimstrong might have a completely wildly different Soviet strategy. And with me as a co-commentator for this match, I have Peter, the Relic Balance developer. What's up, Peter? Uh, not too much. I'm thinking that uh, Aimstrong is definitely going to go in M3. I think, <laughs> tur think so. tournament mentality. He wants to get back at Sefa the same way that Sefa got, got to him. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting to see how Aimstrong plays his Soviets. Will he go for the M3 like Sefa did and many other players do as well? What Doctrine will he choose? It's all very, very interesting. All players, a lot of especially the high skill players have wildly different metagames and build orders. You know, you see Aimstrong's very large tier 1 compared to, I think we saw one of the Sefa games in the finals. He just went for a regular 2 grand, 2 MG and then just kept taking after that. But Aimstrong doesn't do that. But we're at the 5 second mark. You ready to go, Peter? I'm ready to go. Unpause in three, two, one, unpause. Six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And so, as we mentioned in the beginning of the last cast, me and Tommy, we were talking about the map and the resource layout is a little bit different. Uh, maybe you want to, uh, you know, evolve that a little bit? Yeah, I think if you look at, um, you know, you look at that uh, munitions on the south side, that point is definitely a little bit tighter. It's not as open as it is on the winter version. You got that little green cover half track. Which oh yeah, becomes um, a point of a point of conflict right there, um, and I think that um, there's a number of other changes around the map just between like the way that uh, things are put. I think there's no um, there's no fence on that top. If you look at that top uh, where the munitions and the fuel in, in between there, that, that big fence yeah. in the winter map, that's yeah, yeah, not yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, that's completely open. There's a completely a different new flow. road. Yeah, yep. because yep. obviously you, you can destroy that fence uh, in the winter version, but then you got to have some vehicle to actually run over it. Otherwise, you know, maybe you can throw a grenade at it or use attack ground with a pack, for example, etc. But in the initial stages, you can't traverse that area. Yeah, it's huge. And I mean, even if you look a little bit too, uh, if you go a little bit closer to that uh, West player's base, there's more of an actual impasse. Um, the, the flow is completely different on this map. Completely yeah. different, which has a big impact on how you play. So maybe you want to give some tips as uh, you know you are the Relic Balance developer and you know you know a lot about the maps and the game and how it works and you know some some tips for the newer players uh, you know maybe about this map Summer Colony uh, you know how the layout what should you focus on at either faction north south what do you think Well as Germans you definitely want to you want to you want to focus on containment I think there's a lot of chokes in this map and there's a lot of um, areas where you could put down an MG and really cut it off um, I think you got to be careful though Leave an MG by itself, especially we've seen the way that uh, the M3s have dominated, yeah. you know. Um, but I think that, uh, it, you know, if you're going to go with a heavy grenadier uh, belt, you definitely want to control the green cover. A lot of the key points here have some, you know, really, really um, prominent green cover that will de define that battle. Yeah, some stone walls, you got some, some lumber piles that also offer green cover, and you have those two strong buildings in the in the center, one to the west and one to the east, the shirts there, so yeah, I can see where you're coming from. And also, I really like that, that, that the green cover truck at the southern munitions, where we have the NG opening up on the one of the Cosby squads out yeah. from Aimstrong right now, forcing them to retreat. Look at Sefa, just set up his MG up, he knew the guy was going to go, he knew Aimstrong was going to go for that uh, munition point on the south, set that MG up preemptively, and boom, surprise attack. Yeah. Forced to retreat on the conscript. Yeah, complete surprise, completely caught off guard there, and he was forced to retreat. And we did actually have those pios. We had a competent air squad from Aimstrong jump into the building at the northern munitions, and they jumped out to cap that, and they went around, capped the cut off for the fuel in the north, and cut. Aimstrong off from his fuel supply and then they went around the fence and in the back door of that house and surprises these combat engineers from Aimstrong he does get the cap he was almost finished so let's just go away and start decapping this strategic point now from Sefa but right now map control looks 50 50 I'd say um you know I'd say it's slightly uh, in favor of Aimstrong right now slightly in favor on the Soviet do you do you think that Soviets have you know map dominance in the early game as they can get conscripts out of their tier zero building instead of having to build a base building in the beginning? I think it depends. It depends on how, how the map's designed. I think that they can have that uh, potential for uh, map dominance, but 
I find that a lot of it comes down to the way you position your MGs, and it's forcing the retreats. A good German player will try and force one or two conscripts to retreat early on, which would significantly hinder the Soviet captain power. Yeah, I agree with that exactly. It's kind of was how it was in Vico as well. One nicely positioned MG to catch a rifleman squad somewhere, for example, and retreat that. That means that's going to be less capping from your opponent. And every time you can do that, it's a small victory in its own. Uh, we do actually have the Tier 1 building under construction for Armstrong right now. So if he's going to go for the... the, the the M3s, or maybe as we saw in his Soviet game in the semi-finals where he went for Sniper. I think he went for one M3 and then he got Snipers as well. Uh, what do you think about the M3? Maybe you can uh, leak a little bit of information. Is it being looked into, or how are you guys yeah, at Relic looking at it right now? Yeah, the M3 is definitely on our agenda. You know, it's something that I think we were aware of, um, you know, just, you know, even during the beta. Uh, we just wanted to see how everything flushed out before we made any changes, so... Expect something in the future, um, and yeah, we'll leave it at that. Yep, that's good enough, I think. Hopefully you guys in the chat will enjoy that, and, you know, rest assured that Relic is looking at everything. I know that much, because we've actually gotten, I think, when the community members were over there and visited Relic HQ in Canada, uh, you actually, I, th I believe you told them, I think I read it on Ami's blog, for example, that you know, you're looking in on the fan site forums, on the official forums, you're just going through information day in and day out. Oh yeah, I'm always reading the posts, I mean, just in between games here, I was looking at some forum posts, and, you know, we're always, we're always keeping on track, uh, everything's getting reported to the, to the team, and uh, we're making decisions. Things That's just don't happen right away, there's a lot of testing, and there's a lot of, um, uh, things that have to happen before they can actually get patched out. Yeah, you gotta put it in the game, and you gotta do all this and that, you know, it takes time, obviously, and you... you also, you have to go through uh, an amazing amount of forum posts, I bet, to actually yeah. see what information is correct and what information is just from players that maybe, there. you know, there's quite a lot of players that get very angry when they lose at games, for example, and then they take it out on some form, some specific unit, and it might not always be accurate, so it yeah. can't be easy balancing a game. No, it's definitely not. So, uh, I mean, uh, one thing that I know is with the tournament, and one thing that I was just kind of commenting on with um, Seth's last game is, you know, the gameplay impact of that M3, it's just, it's forcing that, it's forcing the German player to use FOSS and it's draining their munitions. And I think that that's having a big income or a big uh, uh, effect on their actual tier 2 units. I mean, you, you're not able to rush that uh, flamethrower or even upgun that, that 222. And I think that's one of the things that leads to the, the strong success of that right now. Ooh, the scout car out from Sefa gets at It took a bit of flag from the MG on the M3 as well, and is most likely going to be polished off by small arms fire here. But it looks like Aimstrong is going for the green cover, so he can stall a bit, but that scout car might be able to reverse out of that because of that. Yeah, I think Aimstrong should have punished that. He should have moved forward. Oh, he's really kind of stuck now. now, though. He's stuck in the hedge. He can't really go yeah. anywhere. He's waiting for reinforcements, but the small arms fire is enough to polish that off. So, if he was intending to upgun that scout car, that option is now gone. So the M3 yeah. is still going to be at large, I guess. He's building another 222, and he's upgunning his uh, 251. So we'll see what happens. That flamethrower was very key to his last uh, tournament match. Yeah, he he did some made some great use out of it, and these conscripts are kind of caught out, they're gonna run past the building, and they're actually very low health, down to two men, but there's nothing on the retreat path to fear, so he's going to be okay, doctrine choice now from Aimstrong, calling in guards, and he went with the guard motor coordination tactics, just like he did in his previous Soviet game, so I bet this is, you know, his game strategy is this specific commander. We got a lot of units on retreat right now by Soviets. We got two conscript squads just been retreated. Uh, he's afraid of oh, that third one right now. Yeah. He doesn't want that Flammenwerfer to deal him too much manpower damage. Aimstrong is all about denying manpower damage to his own army. He takes the retreat and gives away a bit of territory before he loses men. That's generally what was his mentality in Company of Heroes 1. Right. You gotta be careful with that, though. Sometimes, if you, if you, I mean, if you, if you can spare the micro, you can just uh, delay a unit a little longer. That gives them. Uh, you can potentially, potentially uh, deny resources to that opponent. And I think that's something that we see a lot in our eternal games. Uh, it's gonna be real interesting that when you you balance them, play against each other, you gotta try everything. Yeah, definitely. Like you know, hiding, you know, going around buildings and so forth, just to keep that unit played a little longer. It's micro-intensive, but if you can pull it off, it's very rewarding. 
Yeah, I can see that being extremely rewarding, actually. We do have the new 222, the armored car, the scout car, up gun now with a 2 centimeter. So he's going to be able to hunt that scout car. But it is loaded up with guards right now. Something that we call your opponent, actually, Marcus, has been named after him as he used it in the beta tournament. And it's going to be, it was named the Marcus car, M3 with guards in it. Yeah, and I think what uh, Seb is going to do here is he's going to use that 251 to tank, and he's going to use 222 to, to do the deeps. And I think that's a really great strat. Because the 222 two, just doesn't have the durability of the, 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 the 251. Yeah, that Flamma Murphy can take quite a lot of punishment, actually. I believe that Aimstrong was intending to throw an AT nade, but I'm not exactly sure. He was forced to retreat down in the south with one Country squad. He oh, still has a comment in here, though. Oh, he might get him on retreat here. The sniper might be in trouble, but here comes the Marcus car, loaded up with guards. They get caught on their own retreating troops a little bit, and they're going to try and go hunt that, but I'm not exactly sure if Aimstrong knows exactly where he went. He's going to see it soon. These Panzer Grenadiers going to engage this combat engineer squad with a flamethrower and a cosmic squad. Ooh, Ryus might be an 18 8 attempt here. This Definitely is going to be punishing. Yeah. There it goes, and here comes the Marcus car now with guards in it. They might be able to polish off this very expensive investment from Sefa being 120 munitions. Oh, come on, PTRS yeah, rifles. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. <gasps> Abandoned. If he steals that and turns it against the Oh, he's the going Germans, to do it. This could be... No, he's just going to go oh, blow it up. That would have been a huge gain if he had taken that 251. It would have been just devastating. Well, I guess we've talked about this a lot, uh, you know, about heavy weapons in Company of Heroes 1. MGs and packs and AT guns, for example, if you can't take it, always destroy it. So I guess, you know, that adds to Company of Heroes 2, and now it's also added to vehicles. Because as you, can, as you saw there, they can't get abandoned. Do you have any sort of statistics for abandoned vehicles? What kind of statistics? It's about a 5% chance. The, the percentages? 5%? Five, five percent? About a 5, yeah. 5% five death crit, I guess. Yeah, it's a death crit. It looks like right now, Aimstrong actually has a slight map control advantage. He's got 9 more fuel and 47 more munitions. Or, he's at 47 uh, per minute and uh, tw uh, 29 fuel per minute versus Sefa at 20 and 32. Yeah, he does have that sniper squad out, which was very prominent in his game against Marcus, but it only has four kills right now. He's being very, very careful with it. He didn't most likely want that Flammenwerfer to burn him out, and he's most likely afraid of the armored car and, you know, some form of an, a Zerg attack with infantry that he can't hold off. So he's, he's kind of guarding it with his Marcus car. Sniper just hanging yeah. out in the center. Yeah. If you see where uh, Seth on the bottom right now is placing that MG, it's a great spot on this map to put that MG actually a little bit, a little bit to, the, to the south of that point. And you can cover that munitions while capping that field. Really good early game. Uh, get a Pioneer or a Grenadier squad to scout up ahead and you get two points and get really good defensive position. And get that initial force off with your initial MG. You know, that means less capping for your opponents. So you, you want to catch a squad off guard somewhere with your MGs. Yeah. And you want to be careful too. I think a lot of times people build MGs and they don't use them to cap early on. And that really hurts the German capping power. Yeah, it's different from Cup of Heroes 1 where you could not cap, you know, while set up with your MGs, for example. So, uh, but in Cup of Heroes 2, obviously, the capping circle has been added, so it's a little bit changed. Uh, do, do you know the, the reason behind this? Uh, you just thought it was a good system, or was it experimented with in the initial implementations of Cup of Heroes 2? Well, it's about adding more, it's about focusing on tactics, look more like the actual movement and positioning. As far as I remember uh, the discussion, um, I wasn't actually here when that change was made, but yeah, it's just it's about making it a little bit more like, yeah, you're, it's more about cover position and movement and so forth, and not about actually clicking the point. So it's just to open it up a little bit, and I think that's what we've seen happen. Yeah, I really like that addition. That's one of the systems in Company of Heroes 2, you know, the, the changes from Company of Heroes 1 that I really, really like, because that means that you're still you're still fighting, even if you're capping there, and you can stop the cap as well in a different way than just killing the unit, which is, you know, capping the point, which is this in Company of Heroes 1. It's different in Company of Heroes 2. You, you can stop it by getting into the, the capping circle yourself with the right. infantry squad as well. Exactly. So it makes it a lot more about the actual tactics. So it looks like uh, Seth is going for another 251 upgrade on his um, 251. Yeah. yeah, another one. You it's a good strat. Out. Good strat, because he's not picking a munitions heavy doctrine. He does have the recon plane, but other than that, he doesn't have to ha drop too many munitions here and there. So give him a little bit more, and it's, it's super effective for uh, harassment and anti infantry. Right now, Aimstrong is very busy with microing all of his units, etc. All over the map, his snipers are starting to let themselves known now by killing eight German infantry guys. And he's going to start taking in his base 
Tier 4 oh, here we is go. coming up. 2-2-2-2-5-1. Two, 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 Sefa should win this. See what happens. Oh wait, he made it. Nice use of the smoke canister. I know for a fact that, that you also specifically use that ability on your vehicles quite a lot. Yeah, I think um, after having that 1v1 with Sefa, uh, I showed him, you know, I think he, he picked up on that uh, value of the smoke and, and what it actually does gameplay-wise. Interesting fact, uh, smoke actually provides shot blocking, so as well as the sight, the sight block. But um, the flamethrowers can actually ignore the shot block, and if you attack around through the smoke, you can actually cover yourself while doing significant damage. Oh, very, very nifty. Requires a bit of micro, but I can see that being extremely useful, actually. That's a very, very cool tip from Peter, the Relic developer, Balance Dev. Nice. I always enjoy learning new stuff, and I bet a lot of people will start doing stuff that you're telling them right now during this livecast. Yeah, probably. So we'll find out. That uh, It actually works in a lot of ways. You can actually fire over hedges. So that might be considered a bug, so don't, expect, you know, don't be surprised if that gets changed uh, down the road. I know there's also, you know, obviously there's been changes to AT, Nates, and Faust. You, re you reduced uh, the, the range from 20 to 15, about, I believe, in a recent patch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just, we felt like, you know, you want to still be able to kite with your tanks, and at 20 range, even though it's only five on paper, we felt it was so so difficult for your you know your two five one or your tanks to actually stay out of the the the, stu you know, the damage engine range, and it was really slowing down vehicle combat. So that's something that we felt we tested both ways, and we felt that this plays out a little bit better at fifteen range. I know, I know there's been a lot of discussion. Yeah. Yeah, I know for a fact that especially these four semifinalists that we've had on tonight, Sefa, Symbiosis, Aimstrong, and Marcus as well. I, I know that they most they most likely welcome that change to the Faust and the AT nade with the reduced range. Yeah, because you know there's nothing worse than like what we were seeing is a lot of tanks going in, getting grenaded, and then going back. And tank combat was so slow, and we really wanted that to be a key element to uh, COH. So that was you're, one of the you're, considerations. You're all about promoting you know fast reactions and micro etc., which I think is you know a stepping to stone to to make a game very competitive. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So let's see what's going on. You know, Aimstrong's army is just growing, but I see a lot of units out from Sefa yeah. as well. So I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a, of a unit overview for Aimstrong, which Tommy is following as well. He's got the two guards, three conscripts, two combat engineers with flamethrowers, and a sniper. He now has an SU-85 on the field, as well as that M3, which is still alive. Oh, yeah. What about Sefa's army? How is it looking right now? He got two uh, Pigrens. Oh shoot, he just lost that two five. He, two he had grand. a half track. Had a half track, two Grands, Pioneer, two MGs, and he got the P4 coming out with the 222 supporting. No, oh, so P4 will be hitting the field soonish, I guess, but the counter is basically already on the field. Would you say that the SU85 is basically the go to hard counter against P4 yeah. heavy play? All the way. I, looking at the armies right now, uh, Seth is uphill. He's totally uphill. Um, Aim strong and Scott, basically all the counters on him. And I think that that's going to play out, uh, you know, again, Steph in the long run. He, he's going to have to make some major gains in the next little bit in order to, to stay above. Yeah, it looks to me that Aimstrong is one step ahead of Sefa, actually. He has the counters out even before the P4 hit the field, so he's not going to be scared at all, I think, when he sees this P4. I think he's going to gladly charge at it and try to at it so he can no, follow up with his SU. Yeah, it's good the P4 came out because, I mean, for cost, you know, the P4 is not meant to be... It's meant to be a mixed role, so it's not... Not putting all its uh, marbles into uh, anti-tank, whereas the 85 has a lot more marbles in anti-tank, and it's not—it's uh, not really meant to lose against a P4. So keep that in mind, players. Yeah, uh, that SU-85 tank destroyer is really good at knocking out German medium armor. It is the go-to counter to that, and you know, with the doctrine choice from Aimstrong, he goes tier four, and he still gets the the ability to call on the T-34-85, so he still gets T-34s, which are, would you say, you know, a more of a, a mixed role tank, even the upgun version. Uh, how, how is the differences between the T-34-74 and the 85 when it comes to anti infantry capability, splash and etc.? Yeah, it's quite significant. I mean, the, the 85's not geared towards anti infantry at all. If, if you are hitting infantry with it, it's complete luck. Um, it's basically a snipes, one guy at a time. No, no, no big splash damage. Yeah, it's just, it's just a, you know, it's hitting with a scatter. It's not hitting the infantry. It's, it's completely random. Um, you know, the test is if I were to shoot at a squad capping, would I be able to kill that squad before it finished capping? 
with the with the the 85 the answer is no the t34 on the other hand has a lot of ai that's where most of its value is at and it's really low scatter makes it makes it pretty much every every shot hits or, or, or does some damage to those infantry units so it's nice really great to find yeah L nice little find for the Cephas Grenadiers to pick up a dropped PTRS rifle. It's been laying there for a while, but he actually picked it up now after he fausted an SU. But I guess not exactly sure of the penetration values of the PTRS rifles against an SU-85, but it didn't seem to be doing a lot, lo lot of damage yet. Yeah, and then visually too, they do such low damage, like each rifle does 40 damage. So even when you do penetrate, you don't notice the damage, the health decrease on the unit typically. Like, it looks like it got hit by... Uh, probably an AT grenade, actually, or a boss, but a you, just, yeah, yeah you, you usually won't notice it, so it's really hard to kind of appreciate it as an anti-tank uh, weapon. Wow, he drops the guards out of the M3, buttons the scout car. The scout car deploys smoke to get out of the button, tries to go for a chase against that M3. Still alive, though, he managed to get away, and that scout car, the 222, did not fancy its chances driving past the guard squad. Yeah, no, no. He, he did a good play right there. I think both players were excellent there, you know, popping the guards out to button it. He deploys smokes to get out, and the M3 uses the overdrive ability to get out itself. That was awesome textbook play. They couldn't do anything better in that engagement. You know, one thing that I think Zephyr needs to really do right now to win this engagement, he needs to start laying down some killer mines. You know, once that uh, either the M5, M3 or the preferably the 85 hits that teller mine, it's pretty much dead. You know, 500 damage on that mine, it's one shot from P4 and it's gone. Wow, that is a lot of damage. And it kills M3s in one go as well because the health is fairly low on those light vehicles. Uh, what about the, you know, the, the bigger tanks against teller mines like the IS-2 and the ISU-152? They all take 500. All 500 damage. And uh, how much health yeah. does the, the heavy tanks have? Do you know that? Uh, 962, 1280. I think they're. I think the the ISU. Seriously, new 962, like the exact specific health point. You know, that's dedication right there. You know everything. Yeah, we gotta do it. When it comes to hit points and stats of different units, I guess. I guess it is your job. Pretty much, yeah. That's what it comes down to. Very, very cool. Sniper's going to work up at 14 kills. Very close to vet two now, actually. Gonna give him some nice buff when the snipers hit bed 2, they, they fire faster, faster weapon rate. His P4 got repaired again after initially taking an AT nade, but yeah, I'm not exactly sure if who's actually winning this battle. Both armies look very large and healthy. I still, I'd still say that uh, Aim Strong's got the advantage. Um, Seth hasn't pulled a hard counter to that 85 right now. The AT gun is going to get negated by the snipers. And uh, the amount of shock troops, or the conscripts, that, the amount of conscripts that uh, Amstrong has should be able to ward off the infantry that uh, Seppa has. He's getting quite a bit of veterancy as well. I see Seppa's army is fairly vetted as well. Vet one on the Pegrens and some Grants and MGs, etc. I'm not exactly sure if he has many more than one Vet two Grand squad, which has a stolen PTRS. But Amstrong's army, however, you know, he's got two Vet two conscripts, a Vet two combat engineer, a Vet two sniper. The veterans is starting to roll in, and that's going to make a difference. That's true. I mean, keep in mind, uh, a, vet, a vet three unit's worth twice as much in terms of value as a vet zero unit. So, you're effectively increasing your your your, your punch per pop, and that's that's huge. Yeah, that is uh, very huge. Uh, I I just saw an excellently placed grenade in you know preempting the pegrens from moving there, and they walked right on top of the guard mine in that northern engagement at the munitions All right. point. You know, blew Here's up the end guys. Of the game. End of the game. We got the oh. two, we got the two eighty fives coming out. Let's see what happens. I think this is gonna end the game right here. I think it's gonna be one decisive battle right here now. No, no. Uh, a strong is sitting on enough manpower and fuel to pu push out his eighty uh, fives. Oh yeah. So I yeah. think when those two hit the field, I think it's done. Well, two T thirty four eighty fives combined with the SU eighty five against one P four in a pack that's gonna get sniped out and killed by infantry support. I think you might be onto something right here. And. Armstrong is just waiting. Here they come. Double team yep. is on the field, and they're going to roll onto the front line. But the P4 is abandoned before the T34s even hit the front oh. line. Oh! I don't know what he's doing right here. If he can get around with that 222. Oh, wow. damage engine though. He's not going to be able to circle scrape that destroyed engine. Now he's a sitting duck. That SU85 is laughing. 
Infantry right. support was chased off, however. P4 gets destroyed completely. He got to move that up. Uh, pack up. Yeah, he gets a nice shot off on the SU-85. It reverses away, kills the scout car. Nice Faust nice on one surprise. of the infantry board. Wow, lucky heavy engine damage on the first Faust. Oh, that's, that's always brutal. That's where the, the, the RNG comes into play. And, and the percentages can't be high for that to happen. Oh, it's like 5 or 10. It's quite low. SU-85 managed to get out of range, but this T-34-85 is most likely going to be taken out by the pack. <laughs> I even bundled it to just be safe in case the pack would miss or it would get out of the range from the pack. But yeah, one out of those two T-34-85s already down from Aimstrong didn't have much fun at all. You know, one thing I would like to have seen from Sefa is the use of that uh, mortar half-track. I think there's a lot of times where Aim strong. Like, if you look in the center right now, so many guys grouped together, and that flame barrage is don't ever undervalue it. It's a huge amount of uh, denial. And with the crits on it, just like a flamethrower, 50% chance to knock a guy out instantly. Ooh, that is quite high as well. And we do have the T34 trying to get take out the pack crew, and he does manage to do that. This time, however, the Faust only produces a normal engine damage crit, and the snipers are laying in the herd right now, and there's some pioneers in a building, but they are not much to be not much of a force to be reckoned with at all, and he's extending his hold on the map. At the same time, an MG is guarding the top VP, but he is still bleeding. Sefa down to below 200 VPs now. Yep. Fun fact on engine damage, any engine damage in the game not only reduces your max speed, it also has an impact on your turn rate. So use your engine damage against tank destroyers, it'll make flanking a lot easier. Very, very interesting that it affects the rotation as well. That's gonna make it much easier to circle straight things like the, the tank destroyers with the fixed turrets. Yeah, exactly what the tent was there. Brilliant advice, Peter, I have to say. I'm, I'm really enjoying your tactical insights. You know everything. You know this whole game in and out side. Well, if we didn't, I'd be a little bit concerned, you know what I mean? I mean we spent uh, a year or two actually going through the RNG, uh, RNGs, uh, RGDs and uh, understanding how everything works, so it's part of the job, I guess. Yeah, of course it is. And we do have now Aimstrong. Maybe you're correct, you know, with that motor hat track because he's got a, a nice strong fortification. He's repairing his tanks now. He's got some guards backing up and the snipers running around. Maybe indirect fire will be able to crack this, but I think it's too late for Sefa right now being locked in his yeah. base. He can't have many units left. I don't see that much on the map. I think in the end of the day, his doctrine might have, um, it might have limited him too much. I think when I see an 85, I think one of the, one of the best counters right now is a pack 43 and and building the pack 43 and starting to actually focus on containment and on a small map like this two pack 43s can contain the entire map and just using your p4s your oswins to fend off in three cells yeah you gotta defend those pack 43 emplacements i guess against the infantry because they can't really defend themselves so they need some form of backup but you, i guess you could uh, you could uh, couple it with uh, an mg for example to protect against the infantry mgs and, you know, or uh, oswins but at oswins. this point at this point, if he spends any more fuel on a tier 3, he's pretty much shooting someone in the foot. It's just not going to happen. Now it's going to be too little because the counters are on the field. The SU-85 and the T-34-85 is still alive. It was repaired fully, got its engine back intact. And Aimstrong now trying to go up north and he finds this MG. So the T-34 is going to go over there and respond to that threat and most likely force that MG off and Sefa instantly packs it up and runs away. We have a sniper off now, German sniper. Do you want to talk a little bit about the differences between a German sniper and a Soviet sniper? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. Um, so there's some significant differences. The main one is the rate of fire. It's not a 50% uh, faster shot. It's about uh, 20 or 30% or faster shot. Um, and then in, in terms of durability, the big difference is the snipers have a retained cloak. So as they move from cover to cover, they'll stay cloaked for two or three seconds, whereas a Soviet sniper decloaks, decloaks almost instantly. Uh, and then for the fun fact of the day, uh, you can actually counter snipe a Soviet sniper fairly consistently if you're in heavy cover, because the recloak time is faster than the aim time of the Soviet sniper. Very hard to pull off in an actual gameplay scenario, but... Is it specifically uh, heavy cover? Specifically heavy cover. Very interesting statistics and insight from you, Peter. I really like that. Hmm, now I see. So there is a fairly large possibility to counter snipe in the double Soviet sniper team with a German sniper. Yeah. How about the range differences? Does the German sniper have a longer range? There is uh, no range or accuracy differences on the units. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you know about the... Uh, obviously, you know all the stats. Every question I've asked you, you know the exact answer to everything, even the exact number of hit points an ISD and an ISD 152 had. Um, snipers against buildings? 
Uh, I think it's 50% accuracy on them. 50%? So they, oh. Yeah, 50% chance of miss. I'll have to double check that. Uh, the ISU and IS2, it's 960. They're both at 960. I thought the ISU might be 120, uh, 1280, but it's 960, yeah. Might have been changed in the recent uh, vehicle patch. When you did a massive overhaul of all the vehicles, basically, what, you know, how was the thought process there? You, you just reviewed every single vehicle one by one and then, you know, matched that up, so there's some synergy between it. Uh, I don't know how much detail I can go into. Um, I think there were a lot of changes that we were looking at, and I think it just kind of all got come together, just the way the patch cycle was worked out. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah. We do have uh, Koski Squad down to three men. Ura after this German sniper. He is forced to retreat, and the conscripts don't get a lucky headshot on that retreating German sniper. But Sefa is extremely contained in his base. That 120mm mortar is just constantly laying down fire. And I don't know, right now it looks like Einstrom's army is just growing and growing. Three guards, three conscripts, all the initial conscripts still alive. Both of his initial combat engineers still alive. That's, uh, you know, a feat in itself to keep yeah. those alive. Almost has enough for another P3045 calling, which I imagine that's what he's going for. Well, two more tanks on the field against zero packs now. I don't see a pack on the field that just destroyed the last one that was decrewed. So, without any AT on the field, even this alone T3485 is a big threat. But, you know, three of them plus the SU, that's going to be a base attack right there. Yeah, and I think that what we're seeing a lot with the T4 is snipers. And if you think about it, what's the German going to do against your A5s? Well, AT guns is one bet. Snipers completely negate that. Panzer Shreks, snipers completely negate that. So the 85 and sniper combo is extremely strong late game. And you have to think about how you're going to, how you're going to counter that early on. Once it once it starts to really ramp up, you're going to have a hell of a, hell of a time. Uh, it's extremely problematic to fight against combined arms. I guess you gotta fight it with your own combined arms. That's the real only answer. There's not a go-to unit that will kill everything. So, yeah. Yeah. One thing I haven't seen, one thing that we've done a lot uh, internally is actually using howitzers. And, um, oh. Yeah, like a German howitzer in this scenario would go one... Like, like, look at Aimstrong. He gets so much of his units clumped together. A howitzer barrage right now could be fatal. Yeah, one lucky shot is all that's required uh, and you, you kill off a few units and that, that, that's going to be a, a massive gain and every barrage from the howitzer is basically free. Obviously you pay an initial price. How, how much is the LEFH18 howitzer for the Germans? It's 600. I'll give you another fun fact. Um, we kind of have a, an internal term and I call it a direct fire mode. Um, similar to COH, we have a, a scatter ratio that defines how much max scatter is on that weapon. So, yeah. layman terms. Uh, if you fire a howitzer at point blank, it will shoot exactly where you want it. So you can actually use it in a direct fire mode if you have the barrage available. Very interesting. Uh, we do have nine VPs remaining for Sefa right now, looking very grim. He's not able to leave his base. He's not even nowhere close to VPs. Every single VP is basically guarded. There's something in the way everywhere. And there's the game actually. So only. I think 26 VPs drained off Aimstrong. I think, he, I believe, he drained more off Sefa in the last game, even though it was a bit shorter than this one with all of those M3s just wreaking havoc all over the place. So you got to consider this is a finals match. It's a best of five, which is quite usual in Company of Heroes standards. Best of five for the finals just to get that, you know, the fatigue going, see who can go on the longest and not slip up and actually win the whole tournament. So stay tuned with us, guys. It's going to be Peter again, and he's going to be joined by Tommy. Don't forget to hit that sweet purple follow button. Almost up to 1,500 viewers. Super awesome, guys. Thanks for sticking with us. Final matches will continue soon.